One more tower. This is uh, Experimental 998 Romeo Victor uh, at 25 right, uh, ready for takeoff. Uh, like a right downwind departure with a circle over the runway at about 3,000, or uh, over the airport at about 3,000 feet. Experimental 998 Romeo Victor, looking for tower right, fire right, group, winds 180 at 10, runway 25 right, clear for takeoff. And are you going to be orbiting over the airport at 3,000 feet or higher? That's affirmative. Uh, 8 Romeo Victor will be orbiting the airport at 3,000 feet or higher. Experimental 8 Romeo Victor, how long will you be? What altitude? Um, how, how high are you going to go? Uh, 8 Romeo Victor will be between 3,000 and 5,000, and I would estimate uh, 10 to 15 minutes. All right, Romeo Victor. 8 Romeo Victor is good to go, 2 5, right? 8 Romeo Victor, I'm going to from my 2 5, right? Clear for takeoff. Roger, 8 Romeo Victor, clear for takeoff, 2 5, right? This is it. Hello and welcome. My name is Matt Drawley, and we're here in Livermore, California, at the Livermore Airport in my hangar. Today we're going to talk about the RV-8 that I built that I affectionately named Ruby Vixen. I spent quite a few hours building it and uh, flying it now and she's a pleasure to fly. My dad was a private pilot and we had a Piper Cub and uh, as soon as my feet would reach the pedals, he started teaching me how to fly. And I um, got my private pilot's license in 1986 in Sacramento, California. And in about 52 hours, over a three week period, I got my private pilot's license. And I currently have about a thousand hours about half of which is in RVs, all tailwheel, and uh, I have a significant amount of time in uh, Piper Cubs, Cessna 140s, Aranka Champions, and Satavrias as well. So uh, I've flown lots of different airplanes, and the RV is by far the best flying plane of all of them. It's just a pleasure to fly it, so it's been pretty fun. I'm Katie Drawley, Matt Drawley's wife and constant support during the build process and flying. So Matt had completed and test flown the RV-8 um, before we met. And so the plane that we've worked on together is the RV-4 that we have at home. And then obviously all repairs and maintenance. Um, so I am part of that crew. Okay. <laughs> When I met Matt and he said that he was a pilot, I had never been in a small plane. I had never known any other pilots. I'd only flown commercially. I had no idea what I was in for. And I think it was our third date. We flew to Big Bear and uh, it was unreal. I did not come from an aviation family at all. We are people of the land and uh, sea, so I was not expecting to spend any time in the air. And uh, least of all, expecting that I would, you know, try to learn to fly on my own in a 140 and solo and get all those experiences of feeling confident, you know, behind the yoke so that um, if the need be, that I'd be prepared for whatever we encounter. But it's, amazing. I mean, it's just, you can't help but be incredibly grateful for that perspective and just how phenomenal it is. And it's fun. It's just a great hobby. It's a great adventure. And I feel really lucky that it's something that we get to devote our time to, our fun time. What made you choose a Vans aircraft RV-8 as your project? Well, kit quality for one and the kit completeness and the value of the kit and uh, the performance of the finished aircraft certainly was a deciding factor. And uh, I made several trips up to Oregon to visit the Vans factory 
and uh, I got a ride in the original RV4 by uh, Dick Van Grunsven himself. That was about 1988, I think, and uh, I was hooked. One ride, and I had my checkbook out, so it was pretty fun. When did you start building the RV8, and what was the build timeline? I got the first kit, the tail kit, in June of 2008. Uh, the engine and prop arrived in January of 2009, and the first test flight was uh, May of 2010. And I finally got it painted in October of 2022, about 12 years later. So, uh, and I'm really happy that I waited that long to get it painted because over 12 years there were a lot of little things that were kind of not quite right and needed tweaking and, and fixing and stuff. So I had it apart a lot of times and if it had been painted, all the, I had all those scratches from that disassembly. So I'm really happy I just waited on the paint and flew it around in primer for 12 years. So that was definitely a word to the wise on that. What do you do at Cascade Customs and Design? My name is Stephen Bird, and I'm one of the owner operators here at Cascade Customs and Design. Um, I do the office -y stuff, I paint, a little bit of bodywork buffing, whatever you need, I kind of can do it all. My name is Brian Bird. I, I do everything bodywork, paint, buff, all of it. What are your favorite types of projects? I like big bodywork. I like to make a lot of dust um, and then buff into like the last bit's always fun making something just really shiny. Um, favorite type of project? Um, just outrageously custom, fun, unexpected things. Um, stuff that nobody else is willing to do. I think that's the most fun because it's the most rewarding in the end. When painting an experimental aircraft, what steps can builders take to facilitate the painting process? Or conversely, what actions should they avoid to minimize potential challenges? First and foremost, I think it's really important to, to pick a paint shop right from the beginning and have an idea who you're going to work with. You know, from there, you can start the dialogue early and, and, and find out you know, products and, and colors and should I bond this on this way or things like that. Because, I mean, obviously, as an aircraft builder, you want to do as much of it yourself so you feel better about the project, but at the same time, you don't want to do needless work and you know waste your time and then the body shop gets and has to redo it. So it's good to start all this stuff early, ask what should be done, ask about products to use, you know, and, and just figure out a way so that everything's very linear instead of you know two steps forward, three steps back, and then everyone's just wasting time and money. Um, I mean, probably the first steps ask for help when you don't know what you're doing, you know, and then it's 
use products that are good. Don't, uh, don't skimp on your products. Um, yeah. What advice would you offer builders to ensure a successful painting process? Considering factors such as expectations, paint scheme, color choice, time management, and cost. Honestly, I wouldn't spend as much time if I was them on the fiberglass and just get it to the paint shop and let the pros do it because that's usually where a lot of our time comes in is fixing all their body work. I mean, expectations on quality, at least here, I mean, I feel like an owner can have as high as they want and we can accommodate it. Um, I mean, and the other way too, really. But, you know, we'd prefer to do really nice stuff to put our name on. Um, yeah, cost, I don't know, save some of your budget. <laughs> So the best advice I can give is um, back to what I was saying earlier, like talk to a paint shop and find one early. Use good quality products. There's a zillion times we get planes in where a guy started the project, and he's super happy about it, he's been building it, and he gets ready to start flying it because that's the goal, right? You want to get it flying. And then he goes out and he grabs rattle can or vinyl or stickers and just starts putting it all over the plane to cover up those last little bits because, well, I want to get it flying but it bites you in the butt later when you gotta like scrub it all off or make all these fixes or, or you use an inferior product and then our high quality stuff goes on there and it wrinkles or blisters or we have adhesion issues, stuff like that. Um, the other big one is, is honestly, I think it's a good practice, especially in the RV and the experimental builder world. Get it flying, you know, get it tweaked, get it dialed and go get it painted. Because the longer you're flying that airplane when it's just raw, you're soaking up all that oil and the grease gets in around all the rivets. And no matter how much we clean and try as a paint shop, inevitably that stuff just keeps weeping out and it just could, you know, impact the longevity of our product. So stuff like that. How many hours did it take to complete? Uh, well, like I said, I started in 2008 and it took me about 2,350 hours over 23 months to build it. And, uh, I spent typically about 20 hours on every weekend built working on it and two to three hours most evenings. And then I test flew it on May 3rd, 2010, just shy of two years of building. You can do it, it can be done in a short period of time, but you gotta be devoted and you gotta just stick to it and try to work on it a little bit every day. There was always something that needs doing and just get out in the shop and work on it and you'll get it done. Anyone who has ever met him, flown with him or worked with him will say that he he demands excellence. I mean, he uses only the best parts. He does things a hundred times till it's perfect. And so knowing that those are the standards that he goes about living his day to day, whether it's work or home or hobby, you have so much confidence in that he's not shortcutting. He's not you know, using burnout fuses or anything that just wouldn't have us as safe as could be. And I think that's important. I think as a spouse, especially not being a pilot myself, it's important to feel super confident in that, you know, they're doing everything to make sure you're safe and they're keeping the plane um, at tip top shape. And I really feel like Matt does, and I appreciate that. Which engine and propeller did you select and why? The I, Lycoming IO390 had just come out when I was doing my engine shopping, which is a 210 horsepower injected motor. And I had mine built by Aerosport Power in Kalamoops, Canada. And uh, they did a fantastic job on it. It came out beautiful. I asked them to paint it jet black gloss, and they did. And I had them do the chrome kit, and they put the chrome kit on it, which makes it look really cool. And the valve covers are chrome, and the intake's all chrome. And uh, I put a 72-inch uh, Hartzell propeller constant speed prop on it from Vans, the standard one they sell, and uh, no regrets. It's a great propeller. It works good, and I love having a constant speed prop. The climb is great, and the, it's nice to get it to cruise altitude, and I usually dial it back to about 2,250 RPM at full throttle, and it's super quiet at that, and uh, the economy's about 10 gallons an hour and it cruises about 205 miles per hour. The other thing I did too is I had uh, Aerosport 
Uh, normally they break it in for about three hours on the test stand just to make sure it runs. But I had them put an additional 10 hours on the test stand uh, because then it's essentially broken in and I could have, I could just slap it on the front and go flying with no uh, real break-in period because that had mostly been done on the test stand. So and I think it costs an extra thousand bucks or something, but peace of mind to just be able to not have to run it at full throttle for the first uh, 10 hours of flying was definitely worth the money and spent. So I would recommend that as a process as well if you have that option. I don't know if like homing will do that for you, but certainly uh, Aerosport Power was up for that. At the time of building, it is my understanding that the Lycoming IO390 was not specifically recommended by Vans Aircraft for the RV8. What, if any, issues did you encounter using a non-standard engine on the RV8? Well, anytime you deviate from the Vans plans on a part of the plane, uh, you better be ready for some head scratching and some extra uh, building time because... Uh, it's a lot of work and you kind of have to engineer those solutions yourself and it just takes time. But on the 390, it pretty much the firewall forward kit for the IO360 is almost identical to the IO390 with the exception of the governor for the propeller, which on the 360 is typically mounted on the back, but on the 390, it's up in the front. So all the parts for the control to control the um, prop governor have to come up and over the top of the cylinders, which there's there's a bracket, I think, for the RV-10 that um, works pretty well for that. And so I did have a little trouble with the heat from the cylinders kind of melting the, the casing for the uh, control rod, and I put some heat sleeve over it, which now after about you know, 350 hours, I haven't had any trouble with it. So definitely use some heat sleeve on that. Oh, the other thing that's kind of a big deal is that the 390 requires a larger oil cooler. And uh, on my builder's page, um, I, t I call that number out. And you to try to mount it on the back of the baffle like the smaller one does, it takes quite a bit of extra engineering to get that to fit and uh, to mount securely because it's quite a bit heavier than the stock one. It's almost twice the size. But... Uh, once you do it, it's great and it, the cooling is excellent. Even on hot days, I still see about 185 degrees Fahrenheit, which is perfect. And on cool days, it runs about 165. So it's always it's doing a really good job on that. So yeah, the 390 has been a great motor. I really have no complaints with it. It always starts good and it runs good and it gives out lots of power. I put the uh, Vetterman 4 into 4 exhaust on it which you have to special order from veteran your uh because i don't think vans cares that but it uh it sounds so cool with the four and four and they say it gives you a little bit extra horsepower so i like to say i'm getting 215 horsepower out of it but yeah the 390 highly recommend fits just perfect on the eight no no problems at all
kind of performance numbers do you see in your RV8 with the Lycoming IO390 and a constant speed propeller? Typically I cruise in an over squared configuration at 2250 RPM and full throttle. At 7,000 feet, I lean to 10 to 10 and a half gallons per hour, keeping the EGTs at or under 1400 degrees. This configuration gives me a 200 plus mile an hour cruise or a true airspeed uh, when it's cool out. When it gets warmer, it's not quite that good, but typically I bank on 200 miles per hour. Well, the other thing that's really nice about the 2250 RPM cruise that you get with the constant speed prop is that it's really quiet. It's amazing the noise reduction that you go from takeoff at 2700 RPM to cruise at 2250 when you dial that propeller back. And uh, so again, and the, the amount of fuel flow really drops as well. 10, 10 gallons an hour at 200 miles an hour is a pretty good ratio. Pretty darn happy with the Hartzell prop plus it looks cool on there. So. I highly recommend it, and Vans has a great deal on them. No reason not to get one. What was the hardest part of the overall build? Well, by far the fiberglass was the hardest part. It's not really hard, it's just kind of time consuming, and it takes a lot of time to set it up and get it right, and it's dirty, and you're sanding, and it's making your work workshop a mess, so it's kind of frustrating. And uh, getting the wingtips to fit was probably the trickiest part because you just bolt them on there and, and then they, they tend to kind of warp on the tips. So I had to slice mine down the trailing edge and then kind of squish them a little bit and then drill them back to get it to look good from behind. So that was a lot of work and it's just a lot more fun to build them, build metal parts. But, uh, and it's always frustrating in your mind too, because you think, man, I built a metal, I bought a metal airplane because I want to build metal parts. And then you spend all this time doing fiberglass. The other part that was hard was the bezel that you have to build around the windshield, which you just sort of make out of nothing. You have to kind of just start build, start with raw fiberglass, building it up and, it takes a lot of time and patience, but it's if you take the time, it can look really, really good. The other thing is on the plans that are over the top of the windshield, they tell you to build up a fiberglass layup of that, which uh, I decided to just, I built a cardboard template first that fit out of kind of um, file index card weighted material. And then uh, that works out pretty well because it fits nicely on uh, 032 uh, 2024 and I just cut a first I got the cardboard to fit just right and then I um, transferred that to the uh, 032 uh, aluminum cut it out filed it down just slapped it on there and it's a lot more rigid and there's a lot less fiberglass work I had to do so anytime you can do that it's a good a good thing I have to admit that I did get a crack in my canopy in the rear part right in here because I tightened the screws too much. So that was a thousand dollar exercise in futility. But at this point, I'm glad I did just because the second one always comes out way better and it did. So I'm happy that I spent the time and money to just get it done right, so. How did you stay motivated? Well, uh, I think the key to that is to um, do a little bit of something every single day, no matter how small. If you're out in the workshop, your mind's thinking about it and working on the next problem. So um, I kept mine at home in the workshop as long as I possibly could so that I had no distractions and I didn't have the excuse, oh, I don't want to drive out to the hangar today. It's I can't, ex I have no excuse to not walk out to the workshop and get some work done. And so. I think a little bit every day is the key to staying motivated because it always keeps your brain in the process of what am I going to work on next? And uh, there's always something uh, to work on, 2,350 hours on a, this was a quick build by the way. So even on a quick build, there's a significant outlay of time to get it built. What advice would you give other builders starting out? Well, I would say for me, um, get a big piece of cardboard and write uh, good enough isn't and post that in your workshop and every time you go out to the workshop, touch it because that really is the key to my success. In my opinion was I never, you know, if I dinged up a skin, uh, riveting it incorrectly, 
I would just throw it away, call up bands and say, hey, send me another one, and they would, and be, inside of a week, I could have the, a good one done. And uh, when it's all, you know, at the time, it's like, well, you know, why, why should I spend another three hours building that? But when you're all done and everything is perfect and straight, you'll be super happy that you spent the time and money to build a good one. So don't be afraid to order extra parts, especially now that the kits are all pre-punched. You know, in the old days, uh, I built an RV4 in the uh, early 90s, and the RV4s were just kind of a materials kit. So you had to lay all the holes out, drill them all, deburr them, and dimple them and all that. So it was a substantial amount of work to redo a particular part. But now, because everything is pre-punched, you get it. You just you just have to do the filing and uh, dimpling and and whatnot. So my advice is, if it didn't come out good, do it again. And uh, when your plane is built and flying, you know you'll never remember that extra three hours you had to spend to get it right. I feel like a great builder is patient. I feel like you have to you have to know that it's going to take a long, long time. You're going to need support. You're going to need other people to bounce ideas off of as you hit the wall, um, and you're going to have to just stick with it and and also just never give up because ultimately you want to be flying and you want to be just enjoying it. But there's always going to be maintenance. And as a spouse, I feel like you have to have patience as well because there's going to be a lot of weekends, a lot of weeks where you've got to do the maintenance so that you can go enjoy flying or you've got to do the build to enjoy flying and it is worth it it really is worth it at the end um it just takes a really long time to get there but it it's it's a sacrifice that's worth getting to is there anything you would have done differently well not really um I don't really have any I wish I had at this point in this build because as I just mentioned if there was anything that didn't come out absolutely perfect I just did it again so when it's all said and done I don't have any real regrets about how I built it it's exactly how I wanted it and and uh, there's no no I wish I had which I'm pretty proud of How did the test flight go and what surprised you about flying the plane you built well, I went up to Verona, Oregon and got the uh, RV checkout by Mike Seeger, which was invaluable. Mike's a great guy, super nice, and he's got thousands and thousands of hours in RVs, and he's always got a tip for you, and uh, he's just a super nice guy. It was a fun, just a fun trip up there and hanging out with him, talking airplanes and all that, so... Before I test flew, I had a uh, decathlon, ac access to a decathlon, so I put about 25 or 50 hours on that decathlon, which was nice because it had a constant speed prop as well, which was similar to my configuration. The actual test flight went perfect. I didn't have any issues at all on the test flight, and I just poured the coal to it and took off and flew around the airport about five times, I think, got to about 3,000 feet and just kind of kept my eyes on all the gauges, the oil temperature, the cylinder head temperatures, and the exhaust gas temperatures, just to make sure that everything was working good. Did a few power on stalls with and without flaps, just to make sure that all that was good. And I did a uh, approach to landing stall to kind of feel how that was gonna be to come in. And uh, I called in, I think it was up about 30 minutes. I called in the tower and said, okay, I'm ready to come back. And I did, they sequenced me right into the the pattern I came in made a really nice landing for my very first landing in an RV so my um, test flight was pretty uneventful fortunately but uh, I was I was pretty ready for it and uh, the time with Mike Seeger was invaluable and the time the decathlon was definitely applicable to the look and the feel of the RV uh, series as well so I recommended I would recommend getting at least 25, if not 50 hours in a decathlon or something similar before you do your test flight, just so you're ready as a pilot to handle any kind of 
things that might happen during that. I didn't really think I would have an aptitude to fly. I didn't think I would have the ability, but um, kind of just knowing that it's good as a spouse of a pilot, if you're going to be up there doing, you know, cross country flights, you should know how to talk to a tower, change the radios, know your altitude, land, like that's a priority and things happen and other spouses have been called into action and I felt like I wanted to get as far as I could. Um, and I feel like I have so much more respect for pilots and what they do and um, just how safe you have to be, how much you have to be aware of. And it does, it takes bravery and knowledge and skill. And um, I mean, it's really, it's, I, it's something I'm super thankful for, just getting the opportunity. How comfortable do you feel in an RV-8? Well, right now I have about 500 hours in this RV-8 and probably about 250 hours in an RV-6 as well. So I'm very comfortable flying RVs now, and um, they're a great cross-country aircraft, and uh, we take the RV-8 flying all around, and we flew up to Bend, Oregon, which is about two and a half hour flight from here. Got it painted in October, so that was a pretty fun trip. What are your impressions of Matt Drawley's RV-8 build? How does it stand out among the other home-build aircrafts you've worked on? I think a lot of owners don't take full advantage of all the colors that are out there. There's a lot of crazy colors. Um, most people stick to the, the basics, you know? But Matt's plane was really nice from the beginning. Um, it's probably by far one of the shiniest planes I've ever seen. Um, it was a good build the whole way through. It was a fun project. So Matt's project, I think the biggest thing is that Matt had a plan. And Matt had a vision, I think, from day one. And so working with Matt, it was really easy because he wasn't hemming and hawing about a lot of stuff. It was like, this is the red, this is the gold, these are the things I want to have happen. So when he came in, you know, his build was all geared toward that vision. You know, the panels were fit really nice, the gaps were set. It was all just like, come in, it was built, it looked great, and all we had to do was put the icing on the cake. From the moment I met Matt, I knew that was like his top priority, and finding a place that he would feel comfortable leaving the plane, having them tear it down, 
um, actually paint it and then finding the colors that he wanted, I kind of thought it would be an impossible task. I didn't think we'd be able to find the right place. But when we did, when it was done, and the pride he feels in ownership now, is it's very satisfying. Yeah, the controls on the RV-8 are just sublime. I mean, it, it's everything you dreamed uh, flying a P-51 Mustang would be. And uh, just handles really nice. It does barrel rolls super, super smooth and easy. And uh, I've done a few loops in it, and they're just, it just does it. You don't even have to think about it, really. And uh, landing it, I've got it down where the, I can do wheel landings pretty repeatedly now, and looks pretty darn cool. And it's very comfortable to fly. Nothing tricky about it. Uh, the only thing is when you touch down and you're kind of do on rollout, you better be ready to work those rudder pedals to keep the tail, uh, to keep the nose going down the runway straight. But really there's no surprises in an RV. It's just a fun plane to fly. And uh, you get to build it because you won't be sorry once you finish it too. Why did you choose the tandem seating of the RV-8 opposed to the side-by-side -side seating of an RV-7 or RV-14? Well, I really like the uh, stick in the right hand and the throttle in the left hand like a fighter plane. And uh, plus also in the RV-8, the sides are right here. So um, your visibility is great out of either side. There kind of is more room in the RV-8 per person because uh, you know, just a little bit wider. You don't have a person right here pushed up against you. And then the aesthetics of it, I like to think it sort of looks like a P-51, which is definitely a favorite. There's about 1,609 RV-8s flying worldwide, which is a testament to its appeal, certainly. And I, I'm one of those happy pilots myself, so. How does your wife, Katie, like flying in the back seat? The back seat of the RV-8 is very spacious and roomy and the seat, I spent a lot of time making the seats very comfortable back there. So she loves it really. And uh, I also put a LCD screen in the headrest of the pilot. So there's a GPS map there and we can play DVD movies on long flights. And uh, the DVD audio is mixed into the headphones with the intercom and the airplane radio. So. I think she likes it. She said she likes it, but... <laughs> love flying in the RV-8. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I mean, the agility, the perspective, I like the low wing perspective and looking at the sky and the clouds above me. I, I just think it's, um, it really is just sometimes just supernatural that you're up there and you think, how is this even possible? And it's, it's amazing. It's a great view. It's fast. It's fun. It's such a smooth plane. And, um, and it's, Matt just did an excellent job with all the finishes, which make it so much more comfortable. We do have an RV6, which is side by side. And so that, you know, starting out in that plane and then moving to the tandem, I actually liked it so much better because it's just so much roomier. I still have all the controls in the back if I ever needed to, you know, be called to action. But I feel like um, what I like having more room and then I like having your own perspective. You're seeing out of both sides, whereas when you're side by side, you're kind of just really seeing out of your side. And um, so I, yeah, I've had other people say, oh, I wouldn't want to be in the back seat, but once you're in the air and your tail's up, you know, it's like, yeah, there's someone in front of you, but you'd still have the panel in front of you. And I have a monitor that shows me exactly how high we are, how fast we're going, what our ETA is. So I, and I can still see everything over Matt's shoulders. So I feel like, um, yeah, to me, it's just more comfortable. So I'm grateful for it. I prefer flying in the eight than the six. And we, you know, we've got the great stereo, the heat, everything. So I'm, I'm happy. No complaints. Now that you have a completed paint job and everything is working great, what are your plans? Well, we really want to fly to Mecca, which is the Oshkosh, Wisconsin uh, fly-in, and see if we can get it judged and see if we can maybe bring home a trophy with it. Matt deserves to get that opportunity to present the plane at the stage where you can get the most 
recognition and acknowledgement of your efforts among your peers, other builders who can really respect what you've put into it and the detail. Uh, nothing makes me prouder than we fly, when we fly into an airport and other pilots are ooing and aahing and they you know they want to know what kind of engine, you know, uh, how fast are you going, what's your gas mileage, all that kind of stuff. And it's um, it's just a great opportunity. I think too we've wanted to go for years just to see all the other planes and the environment, but then to really get a present and hopefully get awarded would be uh, like a cherry on top of just getting to have this every day and then really acknowledge. Acknowledging Matt's efforts. I certainly put a lot of tender love and care into every little nut and bolt and screw. So hopefully the judges will feel the same. And uh, we're going to try to go there in 2024 and uh, see what kind of rewards we can pull. Hopefully something. But uh, so that'll be a big, long trip. That'll be the longest trip we've ever taken in it for sure. And uh, so that's a bit of a, a bit of pucker factor on that, getting over the Rockies and stuff, but that ah, will be fine. It handles it fine. It, it's got a full autopilot, so that helps a lot. Takes the fatigue out of it. And uh, I just got to convince Katie that it's going to be fine. So she's getting there. <laughs> Flying in the RV-8, it's... It really is surreal. I mean, it's so smooth. You're flying over terrain closer than you've ever been with a perspective you can only get from the air. Um, I've said number a number of times that it is ethereal. I mean, you can fly, you know, as the sun's coming down, as the sun's coming up close to the clouds, um, you know, over the mountains, flying over Yosemite, views you would just never in your life get to see from the ground. And it really is amazing. And then the RV-8 offers uh, just the speed that you're getting to locations, the agility, um, the way Matt's outfitted the plane with the leather, you know, armrests, headrests, the comfortable cushioned seating, everything just accommodates a nice ride. And um, and having the, the monitor and the headrest so I can see where we're at, what speed we're at, um, how high we're flying. It just gives me a comfort about what we're doing. Would you recommend building a RV to anyone interested in an experimental aircraft? Most certainly. Uh, as I mentioned before, Vans Aircraft uh, produces a world-class kit, and they're great to work with, and uh, they ship when they say they're going to ship, and the quality of the materials that you get, the pre-punched skins and uh, all the material that they fabricate there in uh, Oregon uh, is always top notch and uh, the kit is a really good value as well. Some other kits um, that I had looked at early on, uh, they, they're they a lot more expensive and they don't give you as high quality of product and so uh, I really thought the kit quality is five star in my opinion and um, the, the pricing is pretty darn reasonable and Vance has really prided himself over the last I guess 50 years almost uh, on keeping his prices reasonable. I think flying is incredible. It's just completely amazing. I think everyone should do it. It's nothing to be taken for granted because it is such a privilege and so we treat it that way we treat it as a gift that we've you know an opportunity a gift every time we go up we say our prayers and we are grateful for the time in the sky you have to have patience in your tool belt because it's not a fast process no matter how much time you can devote to it um, yeah i hope it never ends one day everyone has to put their tie downs down and i don't want to i don't want to do that but for every minute that we have until then we're going to enjoy it you can do it, I guess, is the, my closing statement on building an RV. If you're even thinking about it, just order that tail kit, get it in your garage, and just order up your tools, and uh, you're going to love it. It's a super fun plane to build. I mean, I literally, I love to fly it, but I have to say that I love building it just as much as flying it as well. So it's kind of a labor of love then and now. So. Uh, you're never too old to start, so just get on the phone and order order your kit today. You won't regret it. Thank you very much. <laughs>